Welcome to the video format of the Entrepreneur Lifestyle Podcast. And if you haven't yet, please do subscribe to our podcast using the link below. And now enjoy this interview. Today I'm here with Ashley Dudaranok, and who is a renowned China marketing expert, entrepreneur, best-selling author, and vlogger. She's a LinkedIn top voice in marketing, a Holmes Report top 25 uh, in innovator, and made Think 50's radar class of 2021 as a China digital marketing and trend guru. Ashley, I feel so blessed that I get to speak to you today. Welcome to the show. Man, it's such a pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. Fantastic. So let our audience get a feel for you. Could you just share your story in 60 seconds or less as best you can so we get an understanding of what brought you here and where you are on your journey? Absolutely. So I was born in the country that does not exist. I was born in Soviet Union in the last years of it in the Russian Far East. So I am Asian by birth, let me just say that. <laughs> and um, I, yes, I've been you know, studying in Russia and then I've been to UK, I've been to New Zealand. And when I was 17 years old, I moved to mainland China, to the city in the heart of China called Chongqing. Population wise, the biggest in the world with 32 million people. And that's where my digital kind of marketing and social media journey began. Because uh, back then in 2006, 7, 8, 9, up until 10, China was going through a huge digital transformation. And basically, I saw that boom, you know, Facebook was still in the country, Google was very popular, and of course, local players were just coming up and becoming uh, successful and popular as well. And yes, that's how my journey, essentially, I studied in mainland China business economics, I speak Greek, write Mandarin Chinese. Um, and by being in the country at such an important moment, um, I've decided to also connect my professional life with this market, with this country, and of course, with the field of digital marketing. So right now, I run two agencies, uh, both focused in the mainland China, one more doing it for brands, and the other one more consulting and educating and basically bridging the gaps. And uh, yes, I think it's the most exciting marketing market in the world right now because it is pay for play, but it's probably the most advanced and the, the one where branding is everything. Brilliant. I love that so much. So my first question is this, right? Uh, as an entrepreneur, how do you manage your time between all these different projects that you've got on? Because you've got your, your FIRE self-development and mentorship program. You've obviously got Chosan, you've got uh, Alaris, you've got all these different things. How do you manage your time between all these different projects? I mean, some entrepreneurs can barely do one business and you're not doing multiple. How do you manage it? Well, as an entrepreneur, I think that's the biggest misconception. People think that it is one role, like it's one job. In fact, it's three different things. As an entrepreneur, you are, first of all, an expert. You need to be an expert in a field before you start a business, or you need to invite somebody who's an expert. But ultimately, there is a role of an expert. Then there's a role of a leader, like you managing the team, you managing other people or processes or clients or whatever. You being a leader. And the other one is the owner. So when we talk about entrepreneurship, for some of these projects, I am an owner, which means I don't run day-to-day -day things for this business. For others, I am a product, so I am an expert. I need to go, for example, and develop um, certain uh, presentations or deliver a keynote. So I am the product, it cannot function without me. And for some of them, I come in as a leader and I lead the team and guide you know, people forward. So I think it's very, very important to start with that. As an entrepreneur, you need to know that no matter how big or small your business is, even if you're a one-man show, you're never just an entrepreneur. None of us is a business owner purely, unless you're Richard Branson and then you never sell food into, I don't know, the Virgin Galactic or Atlantic or whatever else. And, you know, people run the show and you are just there as a public figure. And none of us is purely an owner. We are always owner, business leader, and an expert. And for me, um, just making sure that I know those roles, I have clear job descriptions for each of them, for mm -hmm. each of my businesses. And with job description, it becomes very, very clear that I need to, for example, as an, as an owner, set the vision and then let the team run with it. And for some projects, for some of my businesses, I need to lead some of the things, either because people are not ready yet or for you know, whichever other reason. So I need to spend, let's say, my morning there. And for others, I am an expert. So I don't show up every day. I don't need to, for example, deliver keynotes to board of directors of BMW every day. But when I do once a month, say, I need to show up and I need to be there, I need to be professional. So I think uh, for me, it's really about that, having that clear job description, uh, also clear and also, um, you know, just plan it out, book it in, get at least half a day off for yourself to think, 
because as an entrepreneur, your first job and the most important one is obviously becoming more and more an owner. And that's what requires a lot of thinking, a lot of brilliant, thinking. brilliant. I love that. So we've got owner, we've got leader, we've got experts. I think that's a fantastic framework to use. So my question is, is when you started Alarice, you know, 10 years ago, when you're in China, how did your role evolve as you started to move forward? Because we have entrepreneurs listening from a variety of different standpoints. At what stage do you think, okay, now's the time for me to step up and be that leader? Maybe it's time to be the owner. Do you do a variety of different ones? How do you best manage that? Well, I think our psychology is very resistant to change. So all of us start a business um, at the stage where we are experts. I mean, very, very few people start, uh, I, I don't even know in which circumstances you would start without being an expert. I mean, that's why 99% of businesses fail or something like that, right? Yes. But you start as an expert, you believe that you're good at something and somebody will pay you money for that. Be it advice, be it baking cupcakes, whatever it is. And for us, because we don't want to change, we really do not want to stop being an expert and start you know, empowering other people, teaching them, we believe that we can do some things better. So basically, the moment you feel your business is not working, that's exactly the moment when you know you need to work on yourself and you need to essentially likely step into the other um, loop, yes, yeah, step into the other role and grow into some, uh, some, something different. And if you were an expert before, most of experts are not qualified leaders. I mean, you know, if you go to Harvard uh, Business School, you study for three years how to be a better leader. There's tons of online courses, there are mentors around us, etc. So leadership is not something that we all have, especially running an organization. So after you're a great, let's say, bread baker, you actually need to go and learn. You, if something's not working in your business, start with yourself first. It first of all means that you have over, uh, kind of overgrew yourself. You need to expand this operation. You need to expand your psychology. You need to become a different kind of um, expert and leader and whatever owner. And then you will essentially get the team or get a bigger team, empower them more, and you will start leading. Again, the moment you see something not working on your business, first thing, work on yourself. So my rule of thumb would be, when do you know that you need to start working on yourself? And in that respect, start expanding with something bigger than what you are today is when something in your business is not working. And most people think, first, I need to arrive at success, and then I need to you know, kind of change my role. In my view, that's the other way around. Yes, yes, yes. I, I completely agree. And I think we have to take on that role and be that person before we start doing it, right? We have to learn, we have to be that leader and then take a step up and start moving things forward. So I, I completely agree with that. So obviously you've had um, a wealth of experience with the Chinese market. And obviously marketing is, is really where you've positioned yourself as an expert and you know a variety of things about that so just for those listening tell us what is the difference between marketing to the western consumers versus chinese consumers because i know there's a, some, a lot of distinctions i do the same thing but i'd love to hear from you what do you see as the key differences that a lot of people don't realize when you're marketing to these different types of consumers right so think about china like suddenly getting into the alice in wonderland book like the world looks normal but it's not like the trees are sort of there but they talk and the caterpillar suddenly asks you questions and smokes uh whatever it was smoking i think it was opium unfortunately in alice in wonderland but um that's not the case the case is it may look like this is just another market this is just another platform these are just other kind of type of consumers but the reality is it's much deeper than that it's like being that alice in wonderland where everything is so deeply different, it's not difficult, but different, that you need to completely adjust the way you are and stop using your old yardstick to measure success, to measure what, how long will it take to get somewhere. You need to completely transform. So when marketing to China, um, I mean, consumers are consumers everywhere. They love trends. They are fun. They like good quality products. They like um, they obviously have a lot of trust in Western products, especially when it comes to on-body, off-body categories. They like good marketing and they are very spoiled. They want, you know, a great customer service right now, this very instant. And they will raise their concerns and you will destroy your brand if you're not kind of performing and delivering that. Unlike many Western consumers that are usually a bit more loyal, a bit more chilled, a bit more relaxed, etc. Chinese consumers are plugged into the most powerful digital ecosystem in the world with payments, digital passports, I mean, uh, social scoring systems, reward systems, bloggers, and whatever. And many people in the West kind of don't really understand what it is. 
So the brand, when you come in and start playing in that field, you also need to become a part of this big digital ecosystem. And if up until about five years ago, the Western, let's call it that internet um, economy and Chinese internet economy, they were kind of developing together, right? They were growing kind of together. So right now, unfortunately or fortunately, the, the differences are so different that they keep growing, but they just keep growing apart. And China is accelerating at a much faster pace, especially post COVID-19. So um, ultimately, there's no one kind of magic, uh, you know, phrase or tagline or one thing that is going to make you successful or more successful in China. But I think the most important understanding is everything is different. You go into China, you are Alice in Wonderland. So get yourself the right um the right advice get yourself the right people on the ground for sure um and um respect the consumers do not come with those assumptions of china three years ago because three years ago it was a different country these were different people and of course don't come with assumptions that were there 10 or 20 years ago because this uh, this country and this market and this mindset does not exist at all anymore yeah i, I completely agree i mean i've been in and out of china for nine years and it's crazy to think of the way in which it evolves and we're constantly wanting to be able to stay on top of it you know to yeah enhance our impact so let's say someone wanted to start marketing in china they're interested in in exposing themselves to the chinese market what would be some of the key mistakes you'd say don't do that and actually start doing this instead like, what would be the kind of go-to's for you that is the foundation in order to start expanding and moving things forward right so one of the biggest one is um, brands do not want to invest in setting up their own presence. They feel that, oh, it's a bit more fine, so it's a bit troublesome. Let us just go with, the, you know, with an online distributor or TP or, you know, somebody who is going to take a problem away and just basically sell our product in China. And that usually works for a couple of years, especially if your product is somehow, you know, it somehow has a defendable position in the category. For example, you are selling um, apples from the UK. So nobody else but the UK farmers can sell apples from the UK. And because Chinese consumers generally feel that, well, apples, Europe, kind of maybe UK has better soil, better, I don't know, for climate, maybe apples from the UK are better than, you know, apples from Fujian, for instance. Um, so you have a defendable position, hopefully, in the market. Um, but the problems come when you want to expand the business. And uh, when you want to expand this business, you understand that after about three years or for some uh, quicker, your business is stagnating. So it's not growing. And you feel like, oh my God, my category is growing. Like let's say baby care or skincare or apples from, from Britain. So why the market is growing, but I'm actually you know, either at the same uh, level or even losing positions. And the reason very often is brand. In China, all the search is branded search. So people do not look for apples. People look for XYZ branded apples. You know, people don't look for shoes, running shoes. They look for Adidas shoes. And if you fail to establish that brand and your TP partner or the online distributor, their role is to sell because that's how they make money, right? They are not there to establish brand. So after a while, this pool of people that just want to buy a product it kind of waits out and others step in with their brands and you are losing your position. So mm -hmm. the biggest mistake is really misunderstanding that you cannot have a long-term success in China by overly relying on somebody who is just going to make the problem disappear. And by yes. the problem, I mean, for example, setting up your own company in China. Yes, it's my fun. Yes, it's troublesome. <laughs> yes, you will have to hire people. Yes, you will have to have this, you know, long-term contracts that basically after three contracts with a person, you have lifetime employment. And yes, it's, you know, the social security is basically 50% of their salary and all that, blah, 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 blah. But setting up a small office, even with three people, I mean, long-term, it's going to be great. And maybe for the first year, you don't need to sell on Chinese platforms, do cross-border. It's fine, do cross-border for a few years. And then when you're ready, get your licenses properly, get your you know, trademark, obviously, before selling anything to China, get your trademarks registered and all that. Um, secure also your community. Don't just rely on TV partners selling, but get your branding right. Set up your communities where you can actually collect fans and thereafter your kind of relationship with customers. Um, in the West, our social media is more like a place to uh, put an ad, but in China, it is your social CRM. There's no other way to communicate with your customer. You cannot send them emails because people don't, set, uh, don't check emails. You cannot send them WhatsApp messages or let's say annoy them with phone calls because right now China introduced one of the world's most 
uh, rigid rules on how you can or cannot caress people with SMSs and phone calls. So essentially, your only way to have this CRM as a brand, especially if you're selling on e-commerce, because e-commerce has all of the client relationships, the platform like JD or Alibaba. Mm -hmm. So your relationship is going to be built on social media. You don't have that platform. You don't have content. You don't have a voice. Um, you know, it's, it's not going to work long term. And in China, we frequently say you are what you publish. So you publish something good, you're good. You publish something bad, you're bad. You publish nothing. And uh, um, another mistake is um, definitely underestimating how much money and time you need for the China market. Um, you know, people still feel that it might be kind of cheap and you might make money within a year or not. You're going to make money within two or three years if you're just entering. And that given that you have a defendable position and you will have to invest a lot in, um, you know, advertising uh, that results in sales. So kind of performance marketing and of course, branding as well. And apart from that, you need to support IDITP, the team that helps you sell because 70% of sales online in China also are happening assisted. So they are not somebody going, you know, on Amazon and just purchasing the towel. It's people who are watching, um, you know, a video or live streaming, and then they actually message a customer service representative and say, oh, is this towel really that fluffy? Or do you have something <laughs> yellow? And they will message you at three o'clock in the morning and you need to be there. Your team, as of, you know, your TP partner team, they're working 24 seven to provide that customer service. And mm -hmm. you as an international brand entering the game right now, you are expected to play by those rules. So I would say these are the major kind of misconceptions and mistakes um, that foreign brands still make. There were a lot more 10 years ago. Right yes. now, they still make mistakes, but the mistakes are, you know, not as uh, kind of silly as we, you know, those that have been in China for a bit longer. Um, they, they are less obvious, but there's still quite a few. Brilliant, brilliant. And I, and I think there's so much, you know, golden nuggets and wisdom that you're sharing there. And I think one of the things that is, is very important is about the brand and how important it is to have that trusted brand and to be able to move forward. And I was watching one of your videos from, I think, two or three years ago where you started looking into personal branding. And I think now, especially with everything with COVID, I think people have started to focus on people even more. It's happened in the West. I think it's happened in China as well. And there are certain individuals that you start to trust. So my question to you now is, how important is it to build a personal brand in China? And how do you go about building that relationship with people through time so that you can sell on top of building that connection with other people? Right. So I would say it's not just for China. Globally right now, if you are in business, you need to have a personal brand. In other words, I mean, in, I back in the day, I didn't like the personal brand tag. What I called it was, um, you know, online reputation or just call it reputation. Hmm. I mean, you, you can't dislike reputation because that makes uh, that makes or breaks your business, right? And ultimately, people want to do business with those they know, like, and trust. Hmm. And this online reputation or this personal brand, or you can call it thought leadership, it is something that makes people know you because they can find you, like you, because you you know, probably have a personality that some people connect with, others might not like it, and this is also okay, and trust you. Why would people trust you? Because you show up every single day. So if you are especially in B2B business, there's no way around it, and it doesn't matter whether you are an insurance salesperson that looks after, you know, B2B businesses, or you are a marketing agency owner or founder or key account manager, or you are selling chemicals and barrels, you know, to somebody in, um, in the Middle East. It's really, it really doesn't matter, but you need to go and share insights relevant for your industry, be mm -hmm. it for your peers, be it for your clients, be it for somebody who's just starting a career in your field, it does not matter. But we all have so much to share, so much to give. And somehow, especially in B2B, let's say consulting services, it was always that, oh, you know, why would I share my best insights? Then they would go and they will never pay me for advice. My advice is always go and share your best, as you said, golden nuggets, just your best tips, because you will, first of all, raise the standard in your industry. You will help people and those clients that you want to have, those that have money, that are big companies, et cetera, they will come to you because, yes, they will learn from you, but they don't want to do it themselves. I can tell you exactly how to open a, let's say, um, WeChat account. I can tell you exactly how to do that. 
it, 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 it is a list of documents and it's a it's a painful process of about three weeks. I can tell you exactly how to do it. But if you are a big company like Colgate Palmolive, you don't want to do it yourself. You will just come and say, you know what, I pay somebody to do that. So go out there and tell them how to do things that you're professional in, um, how to write a great post, uh, how to launch this great, I do not know, Facebook ad, how to bake the perfect carrot cake, whatever it is, your audience, give them the best things that you have. Give out that information that you digested and um, essentially, you know, that is better than when it came to you. And um, this will create, as I said, raise the bar. It will also bring you a lot of business. For me, it worked uh, phenomenally well. And uh, I read a couple of books about three years ago um, that were basically saying that, hey, it, it's time to do thought leadership. Just go out and share your best stuff. Mm-hmm. And I, yeah, I just committed to four months. I said, for these four months, I'm going to publish videos and they're not going to be very good. I, I, I hated myself on video. I was really, really bad. But for like, honestly, five videos a week, I committed, I made a public commitment. And for four months, nothing was happening. And then on months uh, four and a half or five, slowly and gradually, one of the videos was popular. Then I was invited to join, you know, Alibaba um, uh, exclusive event for China watches and then media invited. It was crazy. All of that came through thought leadership. So it's not only for China. And in China, of course, if you want to be an individual thought leader, if you want to represent an industry, if you want to represent, you know, um, I don't know, be just a personal kind of uh, creator, influencer KOL, we call key opinion leader, right? You definitely get registered with uh, proper authorities because right now, be it, um, especially if you're selling something, be it um, a Chinese or a foreigner, you need to get a permit because a lot of e-commerce like live, live streaming is happening online and China has already started regulating it. And if you're selling products, if you are offering certain services or certain advice, yeah, I think advice is still kind of depending on what. If you're a lawyer, right, it might be a bit more difficult. But mm-hmm. ultimately, you can um, get registered and go live and sell products. Or you can just uh, record meaningful educational videos about the topic of your interest online on major platforms. And it's all the same. I think everywhere in the world, it's all the same. You just need to uh, find a platform that works for you. Brilliant. Uh, I completely agree. And I think you've got to be consistent. And I think that's what we see time and time again with different entrepreneurs that, that I speak to. Nothing was happening, but I kept on being consistent. And then it started to snowball and move forward. And I think that's so important. I love the little challenge that you gave yourself of four months, I'm going to do this. And for those listening, I think taking on a challenge like that, using Ashley as an example, I think is so important uh, to be able to help you move forward. And you obviously mentioned about how important that brand is and being able to you know, create it in a way where people look at you as a thought leader. And something that came up for me when you were sharing about sharing your best is that people will listen to you share their best and then they'll pay you to hear more. And I think that's what's so important is to be able to keep sharing because people know, like, and trust you, and then they'll come back for more. So completely agree with what you're saying. So as you're starting to you know, build your business, you're running everything internationally and you're doing all these different things. I think in China, there's a culture of working, working, working. Like I know I was in Shanghai, it was nonstop, like constantly. Whenever I go there, it's 24 seven. How on earth do you manage yourself as you're going through this journey, as you're building your business, as helping all these different clients everywhere in the world? How do you manage to manage yourself whilst you're going through that process? Well, I think at every stage of, you know, your career, life, et cetera, I mean, you go through different phases. When you're very young and you are, uh, you know, super hungry and super excited and this is your first job. Yes, China is a crazy market and a lot of young people that are graduating from university, even though we have this 996 culture, right? And at the same time, 996, it means we work 9 a.m. to 9 p.m. six days a week, right? And at the same time, we have this opposite culture with this pumping when I want to just lie flat and do nothing. Right, so we are stuck somewhere in between of these two kind of extremes. But a lot of people complaining about the rat race. They actually graduating from university and being very hungry in China to say, you know what, I'm going to be the longest um, person sitting in the office and not just to sit there like mm. in some cultures here in Asia, uh, like Korea, Japan. Right, it's about the hours that you put on. But sometimes they just go, I'm going to be the hardest worker in the room always, and I want to give my best. You know, for these three years, basically without holidays, I'm going to do that stuff because they have hungry for success. At another stage of, of your life, you know, they want to seek more of the um, work-life balance. They want to, uh, you know, move somewhere away from Shanghai, Beijing, etc. And I think this is normal. This is normal globally. And China, of course, is no exception. 
So I think each person needs to determine where am I at this stage of life? Do I have a family? Do I have commitments? Do I, uh, am I just hungry? What do I want? Am I working for experience? Am I working for money? Do I want this balance right now? Or do I want to get gain something first before I kind of manifest it in other ways. So for me, there were, um, you know, years when, for example, I was flying probably three weeks a month. I was flying all around the world because I was delivering so many workshops and a keynote, et cetera. My company was working, right? But I was that representative kind of yes. flying, bringing, bringing China to the world in, in a literal, uh, you know, sense that I was, I was flying to, I don't know, to Germany and then to the... Um, uh, to Australia and then to Malaysia and Singapore and Lord knows where. And that was very stressful, but I had fun. I mean, a lot of people look at it and say, oh my God, this is this is really impossible. I can't imagine a life like that. But for that specific time of my life, it was fun. I loved to travel. I loved meeting all those people. I did the things that I loved. I spoke virtually six hours a day, probably three times a week. Um, and all the content about China is not, um, is not you know, something that you learn once and then retell again and again. But you constantly need to have your course, insights yeah. updated. And what I mean is if there are three presentations, then uh, basically two of them are completely different because a lot of things changed. So that was the time. And right now I'm at a stage where I'm more and more out of these three kind of stages that we spoke about expert leader and owner. Yes. In many of my businesses, I'm at the leader slash owner. And in very few products of my businesses, I am still an expert where without me, you know, just like keynotes and basically just keynotes and consulting for very senior people. That's the only thing. And everywhere else, my team basically does it. So I can just lead, I can guide, I can hand, um, pass on my kind of expertise, give the vision um, and, um, and find the right people, just hire the right people, make sure that they're happy. So I enjoy that role. And above all, my role also as a kind of leader of organization, as the face of organization is to do thought leadership. And I also enjoy that part. So at this stage, I am running an organization with great dedicated people. I'm doing the things that I love. I work, um, I start about 8 a.m. and I finish at about 12 or 1. And then I go home and I do my things. I lie in the bathtub for a couple of hours. I watch Poirot TV series. And honestly, and every, I mean, twice a week I have massage. The masseuse is coming over and... Yes. Uh, uh, another time there is basically my Chinese lessons and another time there is, you know, facial that, you know, people that are coming to do all these things for me and with me and yoga, etc. So I think at this stage, I can definitely manage because I've arrived at this place and it was never uh, that five, four, six, ten years ago, right? And right now I'm there and I believe that for people, um, it also gets very difficult to kind of let go and really, you know, let your people, you know, be let them just go and run. And for me, I love leading by absence. Um, I mean, if I'm in the office after one o'clock, I get nervous. So I need to be out of there. My yes. people can handle everything without me. And, you know, uh, basically leadership by absence, I sign after every word. So that is why I'm able to manage so much complexity with relatively little time. Um, and I think that it's not me uniquely. I think everybody can do it with a bit of, with a bit of strategic thinking and planning in your calendar. Brilliant. I love that so much. I think strategic thinking is very important. And obviously, creating that uh, planner and making sure you stick to it is very important. And I love that you've really designed your life now where you know, at one o'clock, you're the absent leader. Like, now you're going to chill out. I think it's very important that you have that mindset and let people take that responsibility. So Ashley, you've been amazing today. Thank you so much for sharing all these different nuggets. Where is the best place for people to connect with you if they've got questions and they want to hear more from you as a thought leader and see you drop more of these golden nuggets? Yes. Uh, well, do connect with me on LinkedIn. It's just, uh, you can search my name, Ashley Dugarino. My DMs are open. Um, I do not accept uh, connection requests from the people that I do not know, but uh, feel free to follow and feel free to send me messages. So DMs are open as mentioned. And guys, um, I share daily insights about Chinese consumers, digital marketing and social media in China uh, on LinkedIn. So this is the best place to watch it. And of course, um, yeah, if any questions, do let me know. Brilliant. Ashley, thank you so much for coming on. If there was one last thing that you wanted someone to take from listening to today, what would that one last thing be? Just act. Just do it. If you if you feel that there is a product in you that's about to be born, there's an idea, there is a, I don't know, um, you know, it is just this feeling inside you that is kind of desire, wish, dream, whatever. Just act. Just act and get inspired and inspire others. 
Uh, there are so many ways to do business. You can right now hustle on the side. You don't need to quit your full-time job. You can do things, you know, as a hobby, whatever. But if you have that product, you have that gift in you that wants out. And I think that's why you usually listen to podcasts like this to inspire you, to give you some ideas. You know, maybe you're unsure. So if you have that in you, find the way to let it out, find the way to give it birth and bring it to the world. And uh, I think this is why we are all here. We are here to add value to a broader community. And we all have so, so, so much to give. Brilliant. Well, thank you so much for coming on. Thank you for everyone that listened. And we will see you in the next one. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Ben, for having me.